I'm Lisa Senecal. And I'm Maya May. And We're Speaking starts now. Happy Women's History Month. Yeah, happy Women's History Month. Very exciting. Uh, incredibly exciting because last night, Kamala Harris and Nancy Pelosi, two strong and principled women, sat behind Joe Biden during the State of the Union Address, a visual representation of progress that reminds us that even in this moment, we're moving forward. We are, and I am a huge Joe Biden fan, but I would be lying if I said I wasn't really excited to one day see three women standing up there before the joint session, or at least a woman in the front row. It's okay if there's a guy behind her. Um, <laughs> all the women. That's, all I do the- keep asking myself, what would the world look like right now with more feminine leadership? So, yeah. uh, But the State of the Union is strong because the American people are strong. Last night, Joe Biden set the tone on how he wants to emerge from crisis, both here and abroad. And he's infusing hope into the process by reminding us that we always take crisis and turn it into opportunity. And he stuck mainly to policies, infrastructure, manufacturing that most Americans, most can agree on. Most can agree on. Um, Republicans found it difficult at times to stand up even in bipartisan moments, but that was way outdone by Robert and Green, who last night decided to distract and derail as they would do, um, (laughs) interrupt uh, what was really a meaningful moment um, to everyone talking about people who have been killed in action um, or have died from burn pits, um, especially because Joe Biden's son died of brain cancer. But, you know, they had to scream out in the middle of it and be incredibly rude and trashy. So, Happy Women's History Month. Yeah, like what? Like, could you imagine having to work with these women on a day-to-day basis? It's like, no wonder. I The amount of emotional intelligence it must take to just, like, it was a lesson in deep breath, right? A lot of that. Uh, Because people like that, all they're trying to do is they're trying to distract from progress. Like, Biden laid out an agenda that meets the needs and hopes of many Americans, like so much so that it elicited actual like bipartisan applause. Like people were applauding. He had and a bunch of good bipartisan applause lines in there. He truly did, like more than we've seen in years. Yeah. Um, and to me, it's like, okay, here's a time where we're coming together, something that we all desperately need. Like we all need hope, doesn't matter what side of the aisle you're on. And we're coming together. And this is the moment that Boebert and Green choose to heckle the president to like heckling democracy. Right. Right. It's like the GOP deployed them just to distract and derail. This is that like, I want to say shiny object, but the last thing I want to describe them as are shiny objects. There's nothing bright or shiny about them. Um, And then, you know, you've got people like DeSantis and Abbott and Youngkin and just doing all the sinister, nasty mission stuff that the GOP wants pushed forward. Um, you know, with all the autocratic legislation that they're passing. Yeah, like, it's almost like they're like, look over here. And meanwhile, these guys are like, not behind the scenes, because they're doing in front of our faces. But it almost feels like it's behind the scenes, because we're all like, Oh, my God, Bober, like, da, 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 da. it's like, no, like, this hateful legislation that we are seeing. Um, this this is our fight. We are fighting against autocracy. And, and this is what we mean by this, like the don't say gay bill, book ban, CRT hysteria. It's literally all designed to build fear. So the GOP can come in as our saviors. Like what? Right. You want to be saved by these people? <sighs> yeah, they're, they're not capable of saving anyone and apparently not even themselves. Um, so we're going to take a look at that. It is yeah. time once again for last week in the Republican Party. So when you say stay out of it, you mean no sanctions, no military aid, just let Russia take the portion of Ukraine they want to take? Yes, absolutely. Putin ain't woke. He is anti-woke. The Russians 
people still know which bathroom to use. They know how many how many genders are there in Russia. Too. Vladimir Putin isn't propagandizing your children into cutting their genitals off. Has Putin ever called me a racist? Has he threatened to get me fired for disagreeing with him? Did he manufacture a worldwide pandemic that wrecked my business and kept me indoors for two years? Did nobody in the White House stop to say, you know what, if we're trying to show a brutal dictator that we're serious about standing up to him, it might not be the best idea to have our military chiefs cowering in pathetic little masks. I want Russia to invade Ukraine and I want them to show what a bitch Joe Biden is. It's hard to make Putin the villain if you have all the facts. Today, we sent another letter to Vladimir Putin asking for an interview. We hope we get it. We also sent a message to the president of Ukraine. We would like that interview too. Now, neither one of these men runs a democracy. Both of them are tyrants. Ukraine's not even a country. It's just a corrupt area where the Clintons have turned into a colony where they can steal money out of. I identify more with Russian, uh, with Putin's Christian values than I do with Joe Biden. There's a direct causal link between Greta Thunberg and um, Vladimir Putin's dominance and being able to invade uh, Ukraine. Under the weakness of Obama and Biden, Vladimir Putin took advantage and he saw a peer in Donald Trump. The problem is not that Putin is smart, which of course he's smart, but the real problem is that our leaders are dumb. Would it be difficult to say that Putin's a bad guy? Is that that hard? Apparently it's really hard, or at least it was really hard last week. And this week we're all supposed to forget that that's what they were all saying last week. And it's going to be really important because God knows they love to gaslight the country. We have to make sure over and over again between now and November and in the future to remind people of where the majority of this GOP was at uh, before and as Vladimir Putin was conducting a criminal invasion of a sovereign, peaceful democracy. Yeah, like we absolutely like I see them trying to like claw their way back to the right side of history. And while I think, yes, we all do need to come together, we need to be very, 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 uh, very straightforward in the part in understanding which part of America didn't want to do that, didn't want to get on the right side of history until they realized they were on the wrong side of history. And I think this is actually a really good sign because it does mean that they're like, oops, Oops, we made an oopsie. Uh, and and so I think even though things may feel very uh, heavy right now because they are, uh, I think this is a moment where people are finally waking up going, oh, uh, you know, the same people who were watching Fox News um, for the last you know year or so are hopefully going, oh, wait a second, Russia, we're supposed to be on the opposite side of Russia and we're seeing all these atrocities now and we're seeing them in real time now that social media is such a huge part of uh, the way war is waged. And I, I, I'd like to believe, uh, I'm going to keep believing that these images are going to wake people up. So, Yeah, and I, th- I think there are a couple of different groups that this might have woken up. Um, we saw the, the trucker convoy oh, yeah. fall apart. <laughs> what happened with that? <laughs> Where the hell is everybody? <laughs> Maybe they realized watching the footage coming out of Ukraine that like being brave and being oppressed, that is not fighting back against needing to wear a mask during a pandemic, right? There are yeah. grandmothers with automatic weapons going to war to defend their country in Ukraine. That's badass. And right? that's defending your freedom. Exactly. And that's why D. Snyder of Twisted Sister said, yes, he endorsed the use of his song for Ukraine and not for the trucker convoy. Loved Twister, S- Twisted Sister as a kid. Used to write it on my trapper keeper. So yep. yes to that. <laughs> um, all right. So speaking of inspiring, moving forward, our guest tonight is one of those people who they're both inspiring, but also make you feel like, what have I done with my life? Like, what am I doing? Like this person, like not only is she a scientist, she's also the first black woman ever elected to represent Georgia's house district 108. Yep. But that's not all. She also co-hosts the podcast, the suburban women problem with Rachel Vindman and Amanda Weinstein in a year when motivation means 
everything. We are so happy to welcome Jasmine Clark to We're Speaking. Hi, Jasmine. Hi, Jasmine. Hi, Hi. thank you so much. We're so incredibly happy that you are here with us uh, because right now we are seeing everyday Ukrainians take up arms, take to the streets to save their democracy, and it's catalyzing efforts here. You have a PhD in microbiology, you're a professor, but then you decided to pivot and become an activist and a politician. What inspired you? So first I wanna uh, clarify, I did not exactly pivot and that I still do all those things. I just added um, to my list of things that I wanna do. And one of the things I decided to do was run for office. Um, I felt like the science voice was uh, not being heard, um, especially when Trump was elected. I, one of the first groups he went after was scientists. I mean, he started censoring language and, you know, just go, had an all out assault on climate science. And I said, uh, we cannot let this uh, stand. We have to do something. So I went from leading marches to, you know, writing my legislators to deciding, hey, I just I'm going to try to be a legislator. And that's uh, when I put my name on a ballot. And uh, I've been, you know, a legislator ever since. Ella, it's both and. I hope everyone's paying attention to that yeah. because it's like you can add it on to the thing yes. that you're doing now. Love it. <laughs> it's incredibly impressive. One of the impressive things you're doing is this podcast, The Suburban Woman with a Problem, which is really, really wonderful. Can you tell us both where the name came from and give us a little description of the podcast? Yes. So the name comes from uh, Lindsey Graham. He, uh, when talking about elections and the Republican Party, he, uh, he stated that the Republican Party has a suburban women problem. Well, what is that problem? They're losing us. And the reason why they're losing us is because they don't know us. They have this idea of who the suburban mom is and what the suburban mom cares about. And their ideas are antiquated and jaded and uh, do not represent the suburban moms that I know. And so the suburban women problem is all about creating a platform and an opportunity for suburban women to have difficult conversations. So uh, me, Rachel and Amanda have some uh, pretty uh, pointed conversations. Uh, sometimes we don't agree. Uh, a lot of times we do, but we don't shy away from difficult topics. And that's really what the Suburban Women Problem podcast is all about. I, and I love that because this idea of what the suburban woman is and who she is and what she thinks about. I actually, I had to put on my suburban woman soccer mom sweater just for this because, <laughs> yes. you know, because people don't know, you know, they look, they assume. And so um, what, like, who are, who are the suburban women in 2022? Is it, is it different regionally? Um, yeah, so it is different regionally. And I think that's where uh, a lot of times the Republican Party can miss the mark. So I live in Gwinnett County here in Georgia. Gwinnett County is incredibly diverse. And when I talk about diverse, I'm talking about hundred uh, over 100 languages spoken, you know, people from multiple countries, uh, you know, ethnicities, races, cultures, traditions, uh, religions, all of these things, all in, you know, not a very large area. And we are the suburbs. So we are the suburbs of Atlanta. And, you know, uh, when you, if you were to just ask a person or ask a one of these people who are in charge of messaging for the Republican Party, who um, is the suburban mom or who is the suburban woman, frankly, they don't think of me. Um, but there's plenty of me out there and there are plenty of people from everywhere with a diversity of thought, again, and diversity of backgrounds and perspectives that make up the suburbs. And so that's the true suburbs. And so, um, again, that's where I think the Republican Party oftentimes misses the mark because they have this prototypical suburban woman, woman mm -hmm. and I don't fit that, my neighbor to my right doesn't fit that. My neighbor across the street doesn't fit that. And because of that, they are um, missing the message. And the message they seem to go to when they're trying to um, solve their suburban women problem is to create fear, right? Absolutely. We saw it in Virginia um, with, with Yunkin 
and now we're talking about book bans and we're supposed to be terrified of the LGBTQ community. And last night, wonderfully, Biden, for the uh, first time, I believe, in a State of the Union, spoke very uh, passionately about transgender people, which was so nice to hear. Do you think being very um, comfortable and forward about um, talking about these issues is a, more of a motivator for the suburban women you're talking about? Or is it a something to rile up the base when the Republicans use it and that's more successful? So that's a very interesting question because I think that Republicans think that the um, suburban women are cowering in their, you know, powder rooms, afraid of the transgender kids. And that's not what's happening. They are the mothers of transgender children. It's yes. not like transgender children only live in, in the city. You know, they are everywhere because they are part of our society and we should embrace them as just being a part of our society, not try to push them out or uh, push them away or make them hide them away. And so, you know, I think, again, you know, they, they use these fear campaigns and they're just throwing things out there to figure out what is the thing that I can use to scare suburban women into voting for me and, in, and voting against the other guy. Because right now they're not voting for me. And so they try. They try with LGBTQ um, uh, issues. You know, they're trying to ban these certain books. Well, guess what? Some of these suburban women want access to those books for their family, for their child, for someone they love or care about. You know, they try with saying, oh, we don't want to talk about race in school. Guess what? Some of these suburban women are the people whose uh, ancestors or elders have been subjected to the very racism that you want to deny. And we cannot have that. We cannot um, try to erase history. And so they don't see um, things that way. Now, is it effective for some people? I'm not naive. Of course it is. There are going to be some people out there that cling to that. And a lot of times, you know, when people do cling to these things or they do find themselves afraid of things, it's usually because they don't understand them because they haven't really had to have a conversation with someone about these things. But when they do, which is what we try to do on the suburban women problem, that's why we bring the guests on that we bring on. When you do actually get to hear from the mother of a trans child, you as a mother realize they care about their children just as much as I do. You know, they're not an alien. They are not something abnormal. They're a mom just like me. And it humanizes people or issues that uh, the Republican Party has really tried to dehumanize and other. And so that's what we do on our podcast. And I think that uh, we are we are definitely seeing that people resonate with how we deliver difficult conversations on the suburban women problem. And overall, I think that while they might get a few, um, we are we are uh, we're pulling them back in and we're saying, come on now, let's let's be reasonable. Let's be rational about what's really going on. Don't let them scare you with the boogeyman. He is not there. I everything that you just said times a kabajillion. Truly, <laughs> um, as the mom of a trans child, uh, we are definitely we want to protect our kids just as much as everybody else wants to protect their kids. And I think what's also interesting is that there are. It's not just the kids; it's like the friends, right? So. Yeah moms do the research they want to know who their friends are hanging out with they want to support their friends friends and so i hear from a lot of moms it's like oh it's the first time they're hearing um you know they them pronouns and so they want to educate themselves and so this it's like moms that's what we do we research we want to find things out we don't want things banned we want to know stuff so i appreciate everything you just said very much so <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, and i think they really make the mistake of thinking um that the suburbs are are all white and not realizing that the there there is not this otherness for an awful lot of people already so trying to now other people when you're living in a community that has multiple races that there are out lgbtq folks 
it's hard to make people scary when you already know them, when you're already right. friends with them, you serve on the PTA together, they're, you know, your kids and their kids are close. So um, hopefully we're, we're making a little progress there. Um, I think we are. Yeah, I think we are. I'm curious about suburban moms do tend or traditionally were national security voters. How do you think what is now happening in Ukraine um, with Putin's horrid aggression um, is going to affect that that group of folks? Well, I think that uh, people are consuming information and they're consuming information, you know, in a lot of different ways. They're consuming information from the media. They're consuming information from social media. They're consuming information from their friends. And I think overwhelmingly, everyone realizes that what Putin is doing is wrong and what Putin is doing cannot be allowed to stand. And that anyone who is siding with Putin for any reason whatsoever they are on the wrong side of history when it comes to this. They are not on the right side. And so people notice when, you know, people are bending over backwards, doing all types of mental and probably physical gymnastics to try to make what Putin is doing uh, seem like it's OK or to try to blame, you know, any any other person for Putin's action other than Putin being a horrible person, um, you know. And the thing about it is I have friends that are on both sides of the aisle and, you know, frankly, most of them are willing to admit that uh, Joe Biden, Joe Biden being in leadership at this moment in time is much better than the alternative. And, you know, we are I think people recognize that. I think Joe Biden has done a lot to try to. Uh, reach across the aisle and just to let people know that he is the president of the United States. And that means he is the president of all people, not just the people who will kiss his ring or kiss his backside, but all people. And I think that that's uh, really, um, really important. I think people are seeing that. And I know that, um, you know, there are a lot of people that had a hard time warming up to uh, Joe Biden. And I can say, honestly, on both sides of the aisle, um, mm -hmm. there were people that were kind of like iffy. But, you know, he has had opportunities to really show strong leadership. And I feel like that's what he's doing. And people notice. And so I think that um, Putin's aggression is something that nobody should be siding with. Nobody should be standing for. Uh, mm -hmm. Nobody should be holding water for Vladimir Putin right now. Absolutely nobody. We see and, the heroes on the Ukrainian side. We see the heroes yes. Zelensky and yes. in Ukraine. And that's who people are siding with. Absolutely. And do you think seeing that and seeing how they are coming together as a nation, do you think that's inspiring people here? Because, you know, Ukraine, they were the underdog. And do you think that's inspiring now to the people who are thinking like, oh, all is lost in America? Absolutely. In fact, you know, when I really think about it, you know, just over a year ago on January 6th, our own democracy was uh, in jeopardy. I mean, we literally had people trying to overthrow the government or, you know, at least try to stop um, our institutions from working the way that they are meant to work. They were literally trying to overthrow an election. Um, you know, that's uh that was our own little test of the uh, fragility of democracy and how you have to fight for it. And then you fast forward to now um, and we see that um, the people of Ukraine are having to fight for democracy on a much larger magnitude than what we had to do on January 6th. But people see the parallels. People understand that Democracy is something that you have to fight for. And now people are um, watching and, and just in, in embodying the that I will fight for my democracy. Grandma's grabbing those AKs like that's inspiring, man. And so, you know, I think that uh, we realize that um, democracy is something you work for and we do it here in America we are watching it happen across the country. The globe is watching this happen, or sorry, across the uh, the ocean. The globe, everyone is seeing this happen. And um, if you are a true lover of democracy, if you care about democracy, whether you are 
domestic or fighting over in Ukraine, then you will be on the side of, I will do whatever I can to hold on to democracy and fight against its enemies. I think one of the the things that seeing what's happened in or is happening in Ukraine has done is to put into perspective for a lot of Americans, especially um, people on you know the middle or on the left, who were saying, "I'm exhausted. You know, this is just so hard. It's the stuff from the GOP is relentless." And then you see what fighting for democracy can really look like, um, right. and suddenly. Um, you know, if you're tired, it, it's it's worth fighting uh, the way we need to now in the United States. All politics, even the global issues, end up being local. So what on the local level for these recently, um, for, formerly tired but now rejuvenated folks, what can they be doing in their communities? So I would say, number one, know who your elected officials are and let those make sure those elected officials know who you are. Um, you know, communicate with them. Let them know that you are watching them, you are paying attention to what they do and that you care about the issues. You know, here in Georgia, you know, we have had um, a lot of hits to democracy, if I'm being really honest. We pass bills that really are questionable whether or not they should even be constitutional. Uh, we pass maps that a judge pretty much flat out said, these maps are probably unlawful, um, but unfortunately because of timing, I'm not gonna do anything about it. You know, we have, uh, we're seeing a lot of uh, bills that again, um, really attack members of our community, like our LGBTQ friends and like, uh, you know, people who are not white, <laughs> honest, if I'm being honest. And so, you know, know what's happening at the local level know who is responsible for what's happening, know who's fighting against the bad things and fighting for the good things and communicate with them. So that's really one of the ways that um, people can really be impactful. I know a lot of times they don't think that their voice really matters. Uh, I talk to voters all the time and they're like, you know, um, I don't really feel like that matters. I don't even feel like I even need to vote because what does it even matter? Um, but every person who thinks that chips away from the ability for it to matter. Everyone needs to buy in because it's your buy in. It is your participation that makes it matter. And so I know it's exhausting. Uh, I get exhausted a lot. I, you know, I, uh, I can definitely say I've been tired uh, this year. I thought we were going to get some type of break. I don't know why I thought that, um, but I've been tired. Uh, but I keep fighting because we have to fight. Mm -hmm. So I take a breath, catch my breath, and then I get back in the race because we have to. And so, yeah, I, the number one thing that people need to know, your voice and your vote absolutely does matter. Yes. Well said, even though we may be tired, our vote and our voice matters. Thank you so much for saying that. Um, and for sh and, and also for up top, just saying, I didn't pivot. I think that right there, this idea that we can continue to live our lives, but also add on being civically engaged is so important for so many people to hear right now. Um, so I love watching the work that you are doing. So thank you so much for being here with us. And we hope to have you back. Yes, thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate this conversation. Well, thank you. Thanks. Everybody get to work. You know what I mean? Get to work. Yeah, we we can all be doing something. <laughs> there, There's not a single one of us that it doesn't matter whether or not we're doing something. So that, that was inspiring. She's a tremendous inspiration, um, although she makes me feel completely inadequate. But still, that's, that's inspiring to like do more. You can do more. We're doing it. You know, if you could add it to your to-do list, it's like give yourself like, you know, 10 minutes a day where you just get civically engaged or you get informed or you just have like a nice conversation with somebody. Um, but I love the idea of holding our elected officials accountable because if they know that you're paying attention, they will act differently. They are humans. So they know they need your vote in order to stay in office. It's not just about the funding and where their funding is coming from. It's also about the vote. At the end of the day, it's the vote. So right. um, show them that you are paying attention. Um, and I know you're paying attention because we asked you uh, on our socials, we asked, uh, how is the fight for democracy in Ukraine inspiring you to act locally? And here are some of your responses. 
Um, at Ladybird Levens, I love that. I am baking solidarity <laughs> sourdough with Ukraine and giving to local Ukrainians. How wonderful. I love that. Absolutely. Um, from uh, The Real on Fuego, uh, it inspired me to be ruthlessly empathetic, brashly expressing positivity, put it on a t-shirt, love it. Love it. Yep, that is wonderful. Okay, I'm trying to read the next one. At Bermster, uh, bought books for my friend's high school history class on genocide off her Amazon wish list. Gifting books, always an amazing thing to mm -hmm. do. Yeah, staying informed, helping other people stay informed, incredible. Um, and then we have R. Corlew. I am evaluating the leaders in Arizona who seem to praise Putin. I will be protesting against them. That's the accountability that we are talking about. So y'all are already doing it. You don't even need us to tell you. You've got this. We've got this. Yep, we do. We do because as we consistently say, there are more of us than mm. there are of them. We just have to be active. Um, yes. Another thing you can do is tomorrow night, check out the breakdown with Tara Setmayer and Rick Wilson. Um, they will be on at seven Eastern for Pacific. And they're going to have uh, Tom Nichols back on the show. Um, and he's phenomenal. So we will see you next time. And hopefully they will see you tomorrow night. Yeah. Yes, hopefully. And uh, the union, uh, we are uh, launching the union shortly. It's a single issue pro-democracy coalition. Um, while the union is supported in its launch by the Lincoln Project in the reach of our 7 million followers, we are an independent, volunteer-driven, self-organizing force of people, partners and actions aligned in the defense of our democracy. Yep. Go to jointheunion.us um, and you will find many ways. Sign up and we'll make sure that, that you have more than enough places to feel like you're making a difference. Good night, Al. Good night, everybody. <laughs>